Just gonna make sure that this is screen. Okay. I think there's a small issue with the screen. I apologize. Um, Ah. I apologize for the delays. I have a small issue with my screen. I don't know why it's not lit. Okay. All right, good, after, good morning and good afternoon to everybody um, attending today's webinar. So today we'll be taking a closer look at the European and Brazilian agro-food industry. My, um, my name is Edward Leone and I'm a project manager at the European Business and Innovation Center Network. Um, and today I'll be the webinar's moderator. Right, we have quite a lot of different points to discuss today uh, but before introducing today's speaker um, speakers and enrich in brazil as a project and its various um, available services i would like to make sure that everybody here has a good understanding of how the webinar platform operates so on this screen here's a short introduction to the sort of webinar interaction tool so throughout this presentation, we're really looking forward to sort of a lively and dynamic discussion. Therefore, um, please keep in mind um, and please feel free to send us all your questions, which can be done via the question box on your screen. And also, please keep in mind that when you send us your questions, we will hold on to them until the end of the presentation and they will be answered during the Q&A session. Also, please keep in mind that um, we are recording today's webinar and it will, it will be made available um, in the following days. So as an introduction to the speakers, I am uh, delighted to welcome and introduce Maria Kierova and Tiago Tarvarez from Valdani Vicaro Associati, VVA. Um, and we are also joined by, by Marcia Barcelos from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Right, let's move on to the next slide so we can have a closer look at today's agenda. So in today's webinar, I will start off by um, giving a short introduction about Enrich in Brazil and its various um, services um, that are available. And once finished, Maria and Tiago will present the impacts of the digital economy on the food chain and the cap and the various study outcomes. Following uh, their sort of presentation, Mar Marcia will uh, sort of delve into the, the roadmaps for food security and sustainable agriculture and um, will provide um, will provide some interesting insights under the INCOBRA project. And um, for those of you who are not really aware of what the INCOBRA project is, it was a project that aimed at sort of increasing the international science, technology and innovation um, cooperation between Brazil and the European Union. Um, and it's sort of following um, Marcia's presentation, um, we left the sort of 10 minute time slots uh, so that we can have a Q&A uh, session. No. All right. So Enrich uh, is global network. And as you may see from the slide, Enrich is a global network of centers and hubs that promotes the internationalization of um, EU science, technology and innovation. Um, 
Enrich in Brazil is not a standalone project. It's uh, part of a broader framework of centers with uh, three active centers in Brazil, China, and uh, the United States. And all centers offer sort of similar services, which are essentially to connect European research technology and business organization with uh, three global front runner innovation markets, which are Brazil, China, uh, and, um, and the United States. So our promise to the market. Um, Enrich in Brazil's overall mission is to really sort of encourage and uh, really facilitate um, cooperation in research, technology, entrepreneurship between um, Europe and Brazil. And uh, we do this uh, by um, supporting and empowering uh, sort of all innovation actors along the innovation value chain. Um, and in a sense, we're really here to sort of foster collaboration between um, actors from both sides of the ocean and to facilitate connections uh, with uh, the key objective of our center um, to sort of support you in finding the right entry point in Brazil or vice versa in, in Europe. Enrich community. Um, Enrich in Brazil um, consists of several types of members which together represent the Enrich in Brazil community. Um, it's, a, it's a network of actors that are interested in either benefiting from or uh, providing services in support of European research and innovation players um, entering the sort of Brazilian market and like I just mentioned vice versa entering the, 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 the European market for the Brazilians. Um, and like I mentioned, there is indeed different ways to get involved, either as a pu pure beneficiary um, of the services that the, serv the center offers. Uh, and for instance, uh, you can apply to become um, a service provider, which basically means that the organization will support the center in de delivering its services. Um, and Enrich in Brazil through its um, community of trustees aims at providing European researchers um, and entrepreneurs with the most suitable contacts and partners in Brazil um, for projects, uh, research, development and um, innovation. On to the next slide, which here we can see the service portfolio of Enrich in Brazil. Um, and Enrich in Brazil has sort of developed a very comprehensive set of tailored made services, uh, which include um, the following. So some practical information, so you can get informed, some practical information on uh, sort of customized and general level of on doing business in Brazil and Europe, um, like you saw, you can get market and research studies and upcoming events and fairs. Um, you can get connected. Uh, you can find obviously new reliable contacts from within an enriched extensive network. Um, there's funding opportunities where you, you can discover latest funding streams available. Um, you can get advice, um, uh, customized and legal advice from experts on uh, relevant topics uh, in order to sort of operate successfully in uh, the chosen market. Um, and you can get going uh, through sort of training sessions to get fully prepared for business um, in order to sort of hit the ground running, uh, as well as you know, sec secondments and workspace opportunities in key cities in Brazil and uh, in Europe. All right, so that's, that's it for me. Um, we're going to start off with our first presentation um, and I'm going to quickly open up Maria's and Tiago's presentation. Okay, Maria and Tiago, um, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everybody. Oh, there's a bit of a leak on our side, I'm sorry. Um, do I have the control for the presentation? Uh, yes, yes, Maria, you have the control over the presentation. 
is it uh, is it not because working? Uh, maybe? I think it's not. Uh, I cannot change the size. I'm sorry. Okay. This should have worked here. Okay, on my screen it shows that you're a presenter. Um, apologies for this. I think on top you need to select the, to give the control of the mouse. Yeah, that is what I've done, Maria. Okay. And now is it working? No, I'm sorry. Okay, well, um, then um, maybe I'll, I'll just switch the slides for you in order that we can move forward with uh, with this, if, if that's okay with you. Okay, good. Um, so I'm Maria Kimo from VDA. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining the, the webinar. Um, this short presentation uh, will be uh, to give you some insight on the outcome of a project that we did for the European Parliament um, with the topic of impacts of uh, digital technology in the agri-food sector. Uh, so this is just uh, to briefly guide you through the structure of the presentation. So uh, first we'll give some uh, insight on the main digital uh, trends linked with uh, agriculture, the benefits and the, and the challenges that uh, they can bring to, uh, to the sector. Uh, we'll briefly present the stakeholders' uh, view and which exactly are those, are those uh, disruptive technology, how we uh, try to classify them by uh, importance of impact, and um, how the technology is changing the agri-food sector uh, with some vertical integration explanation of the agri-food value chain and, uh, and uh, conclude with uh, the main outcomes. Um, so one of the main trends uh, regarding digital technology in the agriculture sector is the fact that uh, currently farmers uh, and other actors in the value chain are facing a lot of challenges linked to the growing population, the, the growing consumption, therefore uh, challenging environmental uh, conditions for production, climate change, uh, etc. And the fact is that the demand for technology in agriculture is raising um, because they believe that technology can support uh, farmers and other uh, players of the value chain to face those challenges. Um, then, of course, it's, uh, it's a trend because uh, it helps consumers raise their around, um, awareness regarding the information they get, uh, they, um, they have regarding the um, food they purchase. Then uh, um, the food trends are adapting to the consumer and the societal changes, meaning that um, the farmers in the production uh, follow the demand of uh, the new trend in terms of consumption, the consumption pattern. Um, we have an uh, um, increase in the integration of digitalization across the value chain at different levels, and this uh, we'll see uh, later how, um, how it's uh, implied. Of course, it also uh, has uh, an impact in the, in the trend is that new technology also have a uh, uh, change the farming practices, uh, meaning, uh, for example, precision agriculture or uh, automated tractors, uh, soil monitoring, etc. And then, of course, uh, the biotechnology, which is uh, the very new trend that we also believe will shape the future of uh, agriculture. So, regarding the benefits and challenges, um, Starting, let's, uh, let's first start with the challenges then and uh, look at them uh, 
Regarding the farmers, it's difficult for them uh, to integrate technologies uh, for two reasons, uh, two main reasons. The first one is the fact that it demands a lot of investment capability, and especially when it comes to a very um, uh, heavy digitalization or very innovative product, it's uh, difficult for them in terms of uh, um, income, in terms of uh, capital investment to, uh, to take this on board. And also they have uh, still a lack of knowledge regarding how to use them and what exactly uh, is uh, the benefit that they will get by introducing new technologies in their uh, processes. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, it's an enabler to have uh, internet connection and a broadband coverage everywhere in order that uh, the service and the new technologies are working and are um, constantly available. And this can be still a challenge even in Europe. Um, so I suppose it's also a challenge, just, uh, a challenge that uh, Brazil has uh, in common. And then uh, we have uh, the governance uh, of the fair distribution of information between the different partners that can be challenging, especially when it comes to uh, big players versus the uh, small and medium-sized uh, businesses. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see below, a potential negative impact. And of course, we have, uh, uh, when we think about automation in new technologies, uh, there is, of course, this risk of uh, job losses. On a more positive side, when we look at the uh, um, positive impacts and benefits uh, of new technologies, they're distributed across uh, very different and all stakeholders uh, that can take uh, different benefits from, uh, from this. So for farmers, uh, it has a good potential to increase their production, uh, reduce the cost of production, uh, support their decision making, and uh, improve life, life so health, like for example using uh, sensors or uh, IoT devices. Then for the consumers, it gives them uh, more uh, information and in real-time data, for example, on the origin of the product, and in the end, uh, better quality of them. For the public authorities, especially for Europe, uh, what is interesting to see is that it can be beneficial in terms of monitoring of the uh, common agriculture policy and then uh, uh, accurate farm and field evaluation. Then for the environment, it's also beneficial because there are new technology that allows to reduce water consumption uh, or just create better environmental energy and climate uh, change here. And then, of course, uh, new technology also means new players, uh, the introduction uh, of a lot of startups, uh, uh, new technology that are also creating new opportunities for, uh, for small and medium uh, science enterprises. Um, then we have a quick overview of the stakeholders, uh, stakeholders view. So we have, um, as you have seen, uh, for, for the benefits of a lot of stakeholders so on different levels. Um, we know that for farmers, farmers, suppliers, uh, it means that new technology will make them more integrated into, into the farm activities. The farmers will have uh, um, new practices which will increase uh, their rentability, so they will become more profitable. Um, for the distribution and retail sector, it's a very good benefit if we think about the fact that, that they can offer to their customers more information and uh, improve the quality of the products and, uh, that they are shipping. Uh, for the consumers, uh, it's, uh, of course, more information and also um, more knowledge about how the agri-food chain is working, so not only on the product itself, but basically in the entire process. Um, then in startups, there are a lot of collaboration around the introduction of new technology in the agri-food sector, uh, and a lot of new startups and the um, corporate and the organization that supports the startups and the SME in uh, becoming more digital. And then for the, for the government uh, and the international organizations, 
it uh, first it solves uh, problems that are uh, on the social level, but also can uh, decrease their administrative burden and uh, create a more easy way for uh, the people that they interact to make, to make the um, to make their interaction more valuable. And for the scientific view, of course, the, the more research we have, the more new technologies we have involved to collect data, it's, uh, it's a huge resource for knowledge uh, for the scientific communities. Um, so what are actually we are the disruptive technology how they uh, what does it mean by uh, new technology are they all the same of course not there are many kind of different ways to apply digitalization in agriculture we try to categorize them in different segments so the one with very high impact medium impact and low impact the high impact uh, technologies are the internet of things because you can uh, basically uh, create, a, um, make a device smarter and connected by introducing sensors and thus uh, to gain a lot of information that can be collected and then analyzed by uh, farmers, but also the rest of the value chain. Another high impact technology is automation and robotization because it uh, creates uh, first work uh, uh, replace uh, human work that can be heavy, but also um, create more um, time for the farmers, for example, to, uh, to dedicate their, um, their free time uh, on something more uh, valuable as strategy, for example. Then we have artificial intelligence and trustability and deep data. Artificial intelligence, uh, of course, is something very new, uh, not only for the agriculture sector, but overall. So uh, it's something that we'll see in the, even um, evolve in the future. And then trustability and big data, especially important for the end user and, and customers. The medium impact technologies are the ones that uh, they have achieved potential and rapid growth indeed. But uh, their introduction in the agri-food uh, value chain is um, or a bit questionable as the blockchain technology, for example, or it's in somehow already there uh, as the GNSS, um, which actually gives um, navigation position and timing for the, for the various actors in the, in the agriculture sector. Uh, then we have low impact. It's not because it's not important, but rather because it's already there or should be there. And it's something that we broadly use already, like uh, the simply ICD, meaning uh, just the digitalization of uh, having computers uh, rather, rather than paperwork for, uh, for reporting on the agricultural activities, to have a platform for e-business uh, when it comes to the distribution to the consumers or end users, and of course, uh, to make this happen across the networks. So here are just some examples, uh, let's say use cases or application where technology uh, can change the sector. So we have the blockchain technology that is used to trade goods and animals. Uh, we have uh, virtual reality uh, in order to educate customers how farming is happening by uh, just showing them uh, video 30, uh, 360 degree videos of how farming is done. The use of a drone uh, in order to um, um, control and uh, survey the soil moisture. Uh, we have uh, any kind of uh, GNSS technology that can be used for uh, precise agriculture, navigation of tractors uh, or drones as well. Um, we have uh, artificial intelligence and uh, robotization uh, here for machines that uh, you have a code that actually creates the, the movement of the robot and replace um, a process which is um, very repetitive, for example. 
So any, uh, these are just a few examples. There, there are of course many more, but just to see how this can really apply in, in a different case in the agriculture sector. So we can move on. Um, so here we just wanted to show that, uh, so this is the agri, uh, agri tech value chain. Um, so at the top you see the, the value chain um, as it is the traditional one is below. You actually see where uh, new technologies can be applied and for which exactly stakeholders they can be the most um, beneficial. So if we look at the e-business support, more uh, targeted consumers and end users, same goes to blockchain. Uh, if we go to smart farming, smart farming or smart uh, irrigation of land, of course, this is something that is uh, used uh, by farmers or end users. So each type of technology can be associated and targeted to different uh, um, value chain actors. So this is uh, my last uh, my last slide. Uh, just to uh, wrap up uh, the um, the study and uh, looking at the main disruptive drivers and, and trends that uh, we have seen uh, previously, that are the the changing environment, uh, the climate conditions, um, the coin inflation, which uh, also brings us to uncertain future of demand, uh, the urbanization and demand for food. Um, and all these uh, are drivers that make technology um, introduction um, a very important part of the future of the agriculture sector. And this can be accelerated through, uh, through different uh, elements. Uh, first, uh, of course, we, uh, we need to have in the, in, in a, um, investment in R&D because there are still technologies that are not fully, fully operational. So the farmers can make 100% uh, uh, can put 100% trust on them. Uh, then we need to have that availability and sharing of data because uh, all these new technologies are actually very useful if we uh, if we share that and we analyze it. And then we have uh, an infrastructure that should be there for it and uh, the customer uh, acceptance of the, of the changes. Um, and the impact are uh, here just to name some. Uh, of course, we have a, um, efficiency gain in production, uh, the changing market demands that are happening more and more quickly and in predictive ways. So, uh, technology can cope uh, with this. And then uh, also to create value in the logistics for, uh, for the value chain. Um, it may be our last message that the, um, it was a very positive study with uh, a, a lot of positive outcomes and uh, and we saw a large opportunities for implementation of new technologies in uh, agriculture uh, in agriculture and agriculture sector as you have so in different levels for different types of activities but that said it does not mean that it's not dual so uh, all the problems of the, of the world. So yeah, it's a, it's a positive message, but also means that there is a lot of work behind to be done to make it happen. Hello everyone, uh, here is Thiago Tavares, and I myself a Brazilian and living in Europe, so it's always interesting to be part of this project create and actually enhance the collaboration between the two uh, that is very different parts of the world. And uh, what I will present briefly is just uh, uh, the outcomes of a study we have done recently looking at the agriculture sector in Brazil, mostly focused uh, on the innovation part. And why it's important to talk about agriculture in Brazil, uh, obviously because it's a very important sector for the country. You can see that around 6.2 percent of the GDP is actually based on the agriculture sector and it employs almost 10 percent of the active population 
Also, in terms of export, it also represents about $77 billion. So this is something that highlights the importance of the sector to the country. On the other hand, there are several challenges which uh, the country is facing, and it's in related to productivity, uh, but also uh, environmental performance and adaptation to climate change. And uh, digitalization can certainly be one of the elements together with uh, innovative technologies that can actually contribute to tackling these issues. Uh, there is an ongoing agreement between the Brazil and the European Union, uh, which was uh, signed in 2008, which actually foresee the intensive collaboration in research and innovation in several sectors, which include uh, environment, but also uh, agriculture. In the agriculture sector, it focuses mostly innovation and also to improve the trade flows between the two areas. In the next slide, in the next slide, you can see actually uh, one element which is uh, very important for Brazil, which is precision agriculture. So, in fact, in precision agriculture, as you you might know, is a combination of several type of uh, innovative, uh, let's say, technologies which are used, and uh, it's actually present in about sixty percent uh, of the country applications. Uh, when you look into the why we use this, uh, mostly the focus is uh, on the soil condition monitoring due to the low fertility of some of the soils in the country. And basically, this is a technology has been adopted uh, in the country and is growing quite fast. Uh, on the other hand, when you look at yield monitoring, this uh, has the technology that was introduced first, but on the other hand, for the moment, it's just around 5% of production, which is controlled with that. Uh, looking now into the, the production, we can see that uh, basically around 49% of the farmers use somehow uh, some form of uh, precision agriculture. And uh, we see around 8% focused on the soil condition monitoring and only 58% about the very rate applications. What we can conclude here also is that although Brazil is one of the, the countries with higher production of several grains, uh, but including, for example, soybeans, uh, there is still a, a high potential for innovative technologies that can be used in the country. And one of them is automatic steering, which uh, you see in some neighboring countries such as Argentina with a very high implementation, but in Brazil is still uh, a low implementation. And basically, the this is one example that we have here, but in fact, uh, as Maria was mentioning before, there are several new technologies which are being uh, implemented uh, in Europe and worldwide, and we see that there is a, a very important uh, opportunity for collaboration and also to improving uh, and enhancing the, the quality of the products in Brazil, but also the efficiency and productivity as well. So uh, thank you very much for our time. Thank you. All right, Maria and Tiago, many thanks for, for, for this enlightening presentation. Um, I will now switch over the slides and, and Hello. give control over, yeah. Okay, uh, Marcia, the the, the yes. floor is yours. Um, obviously, I, I like I mentioned before, there's a small issue with uh, with, with switching over the, the the sort of keyboard and mouse, so I'll, I'll be okay. changing the slides. I think I can do it. Let's see. No, I can move my mouse. Yeah, I can only access the the mouse, but it's okay. Uh, we can start. So thanks everyone for attending the seminar. Uh, it would be a pleasure to present you a little bit of the work I did for the INCOBRA project uh, in Brazil that joined the different partners. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul here in South Brazil, nearby Uruguay. And the idea was really to develop a roadmap and, and an action plan, uh, especially regarding food security and sustainability uh, for agriculture thinking about climate change and all the challenges uh, we are dealing with. 
So uh, it's really nice that we had the, the former uh, presentation and it's uh, very much connected the, the things uh, we saw. We did this, this research project and many interviews and data collection in 2017. And so it's really uh, nice if we can discuss that a little bit more. Uh, you can go to the next one. Okay, so these are uh, very strategic areas, uh, both for, for Brazil and the EU. Those are uh, priority areas for cooperation between uh, Brazil and EU, uh, especially if we think about the science, technology, and innovation uh, dialogue. Uh, as uh, Tiago mentioned before, Brazil is a, a global producer, uh, exporter of many agriculture and food products. It's one of the biggest producers of soybean, uh, corn, uh, poultry, beef, citrus, sugar cane, uh, amongst others. And um, uh, the challenging thing is that we still have a lot of uh, ready to cultivate uh, uh, areas in the world and without uh, cutting any forest. So really technology is a, is a key issue for Brazil and cooperation with Europe and all the expertise is very important. Uh, on the other hand, we also have a, a very um, industrialized oriented uh, system for agriculture production, very large scale as well. Uh, so this is very important to to think uh, strategically and think about projects that can enhance uh, uh, sustainability. From the EU side, uh, food security and uh, sustainability are actually very strategic. They are very important uh, uh, goals and, and many policies are being uh, in action currently to reduce the impact. And of course, uh, thinking about agri-food systems, how we can um, supply our long-term uh, food resources for, for everyone. So the idea was really to establish uh, and to think about this scenario, how we could act. Okay, next one. So uh, the idea was really to focus in, in cooperation. So how could you also benefit these different uh, stakeholders related to food security and sustainable agriculture and very much align with uh, uh, sustainable development goals uh, that we could achieve uh, based on that. Um, one interesting thing uh, is that uh, basically when we think about the different stakeholders and, and the roles of these uh, different stakeholders, uh, we know that mainly the food system development is mainly driven by this private sector actions, a lot of investments uh, in this sector as a response uh, to opportunities created by changes in consumer behaviors, right? So for example, uh, right now we are seeing an emergency of uh, plant-based diets in Brazil. So really changing the way consumers see uh, uh, the way food is being produced. This is uh, already a reality in Europe, but it's quite new in Brazil. Uh, especially I work with uh, in a business school, although I have a background in, in agriculture, but we do a lot of research with consumer, uh, uh, consumers awareness, consumer research and green consumers. And this is very important because normally the public sector takes longer than of course the private and the demands by, by consumers. So it's very important to think about the ways how we can collaborate to bring this uh, demands, right? So for example, uh, increase of vegan uh, population, uh, demand for animal welfare, systems that can really uh, uh, follow traceability, can follow the, the supply chain. And of course, uh, uh, technology, especially uh, uh, information technology is very much related to that. And I think that's a very important uh, point for us to, to collaborate. So uh, the idea is to bring the, the consumer close to the food they wish to, to consume. Um, and of course, uh, we need to develop and improve all the agri-food chains uh, towards more uh, green food systems. We need to do that also by education and empowerment, so not only uh, for consumers, but also for producers as well, and especially for industry. Uh, some work, we'll, I'll mention later on, uh, the development, for example, of eco-innovations and solutions uh, involving circular economy, for example. It's very much important to think from this perspective of uh, multiple agencies uh, working in the food system. Next one, please. So it's critical to have uh, uh, the governmental role, right? 
And uh, of course, we, we identified some critical variables uh, for that. Uh, on the one hand, we see a higher demand for quality, for food security, but we also see a uh, low standardization of small producers, right? So for example, in Brazil and Europe, of course, is not different with uh, such a large area we have in, in terms of, uh, of terrestrial areas, but we also have very different food systems. So for example, just to give you a, 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 an idea, uh, I'm here in South Brazil today, probably today is the, the coldest day in winter so far. Uh, we are four degrees uh, Celsius and maybe in the Amazon today we have uh, 30 or 31. So very different systems and this of course brings also very different standardization of producers. We have some that they already have very high technology as uh, you've mentioned high precision agriculture, uh, but on the other hand you have very small producers with uh, limited uh, awareness, uh, sometimes even unable to read and how to mention use the internet, so the challenges are very big uh, in the country. But we have a growing demand for sustainable products. And I think uh, we need to develop uh, and to foster technologies and collaborations where we can find more sustainable products. In that way, we need to update the whole system. And then we need to work together between technologies, producers, from the field to the fork, and what we do later on, uh, also how we can use uh, these this products. Next one, please. Uh, of course, uh, could you go back a little bit? Just one, just to mention. Um, one of the things that's important, and um, and actually we try to, to cross in this in this roadmap and to see the challenges. Uh, of course, we have a lot of bureaucracy, so we have to deal with that. Uh, restricted funding for research and innovation. When we think about uh, economic crisis and cuts, for example, in universities, etc., this has a very big impact into science and technology. Um, of course, a little bit of few governmental initiatives, as I mentioned, some delay uh, regarding the market. And of course, political and economic instability, they can be some kind of, of critical variables that could uh, uh, delay our, our work. Let's move on. Okay, so the idea was uh, to define, after doing this, this work, uh, we defined two main dimensions uh, where we could foresee uh, the future, right? So what would happen and what would be different uh, opportunities for each one of, this, of these areas in the map. So we could see, for example, if we have high food chain sustainability on or low food chain sustainability in one hand, and the other hand, if we have like low support from policies and regulation or high support from policies and re regulations. This would lead us to four different scenarios. So the first one would be really to have an integrated food system. That would be the ideal goal. And we really hope this can come true. And I believe we have uh, a very, very important uh, uh, things we can collaborate and some were already mentioned uh, before. Uh, we would have a green proactivity uh, scenario where sustainability food chain would be high, but uh, not so strong in policies and regulations. Uh, we would have also then uh, in the, the orange one, like the low edge activity where we have, okay, we are going on, we are moving with what we have in policies and regulations, but we're not, not very much active, we're not very, very much uh, investing in food chain uh, sustainability. And of course, the worst uh, case scenario would be where the food system collapsed where uh, we don't have support uh, from policies and regulations. And uh, of course, uh, food chain sustainability will not uh, move on in, in this system. So we can more or less imagine uh, different strategies and different uh, cooperation actions we could do in each of the cases, okay? Next one. So uh, in the case where we have uh, the integrated uh, food scenario, it would be very interesting to think about uh, food security and nutrition, tools uh, that could help us to have more uh, supply chain integration, and of course, uh, transparent food systems. So uh, as mentioned before, we have many technologies and we have many options that could help us to move this way, like uh, uh, the blockchains, like uh, internet of things, uh, different systems, uh, big data, all of this could be very much integrated. And of course, then um, let's think about Brazil. 
you have nowadays already some realities where integrated food systems are a reality and they could be easily applied or are already uh, in course in this one. Okay. Uh, on the second uh, scenario where we have the, the green proactivity, uh, it's very important because this is the case where we have the chances for uh, the startups, okay, for open scenario for entrepreneurship. Because here uh, they are more advanced, let's say that the food chain is more advanced than the, the policies and the regulations. And this is happening, we have a, a, a very interesting move in Brazil nowadays with the food tax. Uh, we've been recently studying, for example, some, some food tax uh, on reduction of food waste, and this is uh, happening in Brazil. And of course, for these ones, for these uh, first movers, um, normally uh, young people uh, connected to to universities with different backgrounds as well. So they really need uh, solutions and training and especially support, financial support uh, to develop some of the apps and, and solutions they're using. Many regarding, for example, reducing the use of agrochemicals, for example, which that would be something uh, very important. And so this is, uh, uh, it's very interesting. We, we really want to seek potential markets that have higher standards uh, to bring more uh, rigorous practice, also to, to move uh, above what local legislation says. So th this is really an open uh, uh, stage for, for many, many uh, opportunities here. And really exploring niches, of uh, finding solutions that uh, are not the usual, this is a, would be a, an interesting uh, uh, idea, right? Also to increase, for example, mobility between researchers, uh, we have many, many partnerships happening, uh, brainstorming, uh, sharing uh, founding uh, projects, establishing like the green uh, mindset. And I think this can easily be done by uh, communication, by joining, by contact, by network. And this is very nice because I think uh, Enrich could certainly uh, help a lot in, in those uh, different scenarios. Then we have, yeah, the third one, uh, third scenario is the law edge activity. In uh, this scenario, we have uh, uh, policies and regulations, they are effective, uh, but the food chains uh, develop a minimal active uh, activity effort to follow sustainable results. Okay, so uh, of course we really need, if we want to move, uh, uh, to improve the scenario, we really need to go uh, towards food security, towards high quality, to push the system, uh, to bring legislation and, and discuss that. So, for example, uh, recently we've been doing with uh, this the sector of uh, uh, recycling uh, products and uh, reusing products, circular economy as well. Uh, we still don't have all the legislation we need for that, but certainly we can start with the technologies to improve uh, this process, right? Um, and of course, in this scenario, it's not very good because we don't have too much stimulus on uh, eco-innovations. And so uh, it would be interesting to, to, to think about a solution because in this case, many small producers could run out of business. Okay, This would be a very uh, active scenario for competition. And of course, when you don't have so much support, maybe we have the, the risk of running uh, without. And in the fourth scenario, uh, of course, that would be the, the worst ones, uh, weak food chains, uh, absence of policies and regulations, uh, negative effects on, on the nutritional diet, because in this way we don't have so much control on the food we're eating, we are not very much worried about that, and mainly about volume and not so much about quality. So this is absolutely important that we do have, for example, uh, um, especially uh, contacts between people, research and innovation, uh, try to have actions uh, in Europe to, to fight uh, this system, to avoid uh, lack of transparency, opportunistic behavior, and it would be very, very important to have a more uh, a strong connection, especially in the, in the level of uh, legislation and, and, and combinations. Next one. So um, basically in, in when we did a study, two main clusters emerged in terms of uh, opportunities for cooperation. Cluster one would be especially regarding uh, food security, South-North cooperation, traceability, 
zero food waste, improvement of agricultural production systems, uh, digital farming, and plant-based and new uh, protein sources. Uh, on the second one, really some ideas came also, but not so much focused on, on production, but especially on the climate change sustainability, right? So we would say we had two main um, uh, areas where we could think about. And this second one would be really thinking about nutritional aspects, how we can think about the climate is changing and how can we ensure people will have uh, the calories they need, more productivity being sustainable, integrated agri-forest livestock systems. This is a very interesting solution uh, for Brazil. Uh, low carbon agriculture, some support here from, from government included. Uh, we need, to, of course, to lower uh, uh, emissions of, of uh, green uh, gas emissions, precision agriculture, and uh, using uh, circular economy also to reduce uh, the environmental impact. Next one, please. Okay, so um, I do have two minutes, more or less, and uh, that's a very challenging uh, figure. Uh, I left you. We had uh, last year a very interesting uh, uh, conference here in, in Porto Alegre with uh, more than 1,000 participants developing and, and discussing uh, the future of, of agri-food systems. So where are we going uh, from very different perspectives? And uh, this is actually one of the, the, the things they discussed. So where to start? Uh, we have many different issues, right? If you take from, from this view, you can think about uh, terrestrial or aquatic systems, uh, value chains, uh, consumers, civil security, food security, policy, governments, and if you see uh, uh, science and technology, they are all around. Okay? And certainly we need to think about solutions. Uh, I think Brazil is, is evolving rapidly, uh, not in terms of, of productivity that in the last uh, 10 to, to 15 years, it's amazing uh, what happened in, in the sector. From a net importer, we became one of the largest importer of many different agriculture uh, products in the world. But I think now it's really the time to move uh, towards quality. And I'm pretty sure uh, the view, Europe has this positioning of, of, uh, of taking care of the environment, taking care of people, and we certainly uh, will benefit from this model. And I believe we can share many, many different uh, things. And thanks for your attention. And I'll be happy to, to discuss with you uh, different uh, uh, questions, okay? Thanks a lot, uh, Marcia. This was indeed a very uh, enlightening presentation. I'm just trying to switch slides back to mine. Okay. Um, so first of all, I, I, I want to, to, to thank um, today's speakers. Um, presentations were you know, really good, and I really hope that um, this was very useful information for 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 everyone who attended this uh, this webinar. Um, so we we have a couple minutes left. Um, so I suggest we start with with our sort of Q and A session, um, and we'll try and answer as many questions as possible. So um, without any further delay, um, let me take the the sort of first question. Um, and I believe that would be a question that would be targeted uh, well, to any speakers, uh, but um, maybe more Maria and Tiago. Um, it's, it's more about um, sort of how to tackle the lack of knowledge of, of, of sort of small scale farmers regarding um, the sort of potential benefits of uh, digital farming. I think there's an overall lack of uh, knowledge, uh, but um, maybe there's ways uh, of, of sort of improving that. Um, yeah, so um, there are different uh, steps toward this. So if we look at the um, more innovative ways, so uh, usually uh, startups and uh, companies that are new to the market, uh, when they offer the service or the, um, the product that is so-called innovative, uh, it goes with also training sessions and um, 
a kind of uh, support, initial support uh, toward uh, the, the first um, trial of, of the product or the, the new way of, uh, of processing. Um, and then uh, if we talk a bit more general, so there are uh, European initiatives that create uh, uh, like, uh, by the way, EBN as well, uh, which creates these kind of uh, clusters and um, also centers where uh, um, education uh, towards uh, innovative, innovative technologies are happening. And then uh, the more clusters you have or uh, communities of uh, farmers, um, the easiest uh, the way to share information and knowledge together uh, and there are also several platforms that are organized uh, in which different um, communities of farmers uh, can um, enter into con contact with other farmers and exchange practices and any kind of feedback regarding the new technology that they use I okay. Answer the yeah. Um, well, fantastic. And maybe we can move forward with um, a second question. Um, and it's, I think, it's about the sort of areas in Europe in which sort of uh, broadband and internet coverage um, might not be uh, so well distributed. Um, I, I, sort of a question on how to overcome this potential challenge uh, mm -hmm. for uh, digital farming. Uh, well, it's a challenge that it's uh, on national and European level. It's not a challenge that uh, unfortunately can be overcome by uh, uh, by the the farmers or the uh, the farmer suppliers. Uh, it's something that should be um, organized in terms of infrastructure. Uh, so if we look at Europe, uh, there is still uh, places with uh, very remote areas where a connection is, is not very good. So even though uh, the farmer subscribe to a, to a internet connection or a Wi-Fi, it can be difficult to, to use it. And therefore the system, the new technology is not working at the full potential. And uh, if we can take an example, in I think in uh, Eastern European countries, this is uh, uh, still a part of uh, the challenge. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, Maria. Um, let's move forward with with a third question. Um, I've received a question asking uh, the deadline for the Incobra project. Maybe Marcia, if you could uh, reply to this one, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Cobra, I think it's already finishing because, um, let me see, I can check. I don't have the, the precise information now because we already had already um, many different partners, many different meetings, okay? Uh, it was a project, uh, let me see, let me see the dates. We have already events in, in, in Brazil and in Europe, many action plans were already uh, happening. Uh, let's see, we had some, let's see where we have, yeah, if you go to the website, okay, at least I'm, I'm uh, uh, checking here, the Incobra EU, you already have some, uh, many different presentations, because we had, uh, just to give you a feedback, okay, food security and, and uh, sustainability or, or adaptation to, our, uh, to, to climate change was one uh, of the, the key areas, okay, of the focus areas. We had another one on green energy. Another one on sustainable use of uh, bioresources. Another one about uh, nanomaterials and manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, and one about uh, intelligent cities and uh, in, uh, intelligent systems. Okay, so they were all uh, happening simultaneously. And at least from uh, our part, the one from uh, uh, food security, we finished it and presented all the roadmaps. And so now they have these events happening in different places, trying to give uh, follow up from from this uh, main uh, planning that we had in 2017. So um, because I was a, a consultant at the time, right? The main uh, partners uh, are in Sao Paulo. The, the the coordinator is in Sao Paulo, so they are leading more or less this this team. Okay, but let me know if you have any questions uh, uh, later on. You can send me your email, and I'm pretty sure send you more accurate uh, information on that. 
what we know is that we keep uh, uh, open for, for collaboration and we keep receiving uh, uh, the newsletters, etc. But I think the project will certainly move with uh, uh, Vision to, uh, to 2020 to a new, uh, new stage. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Marcia. That's uh, obviously very valuable information. And I hope that answers the question uh, from one of the attendees. Um, maybe moving forward to, um, and I'm very sorry, I won't be able to take all the questions. Um, but um, yeah, moving forward to a question from, from, from Marcia, and it's mostly based on your sort of involvement within the INCOBRA project. Um, would you say that Brazil and the EU have a sort of common approach uh, or vision for sustainable agriculture food production? Um, and could be also very interesting if maybe Thiago, or maybe you have some knowledge with regards to that, so you could share some insights as well. Um, yeah, so if the yeah. EU and Brazil have a sort of common and vision for, for sustainable agriculture food production. Yeah, that's a tricky challenging, I mean, a uh, tricky uh, question. Uh, right now we are living in a, a period of transition in Brazil, of governmental uh, transition. So, um, of course, now we are still, let's say, the new government is changed a little bit, the Minister of Agriculture changes uh, the Minister of Environment. But certainly uh, we have a general feeling, especially in the academia, uh, companies uh, related, uh, even part of the, the population, the more well-educated population, this is already a reality, right? So everybody knows we can move forward uh, with the way we were producing before. And this was, uh, of course, a question of development of the country, right? So uh, in the 70s, Brazil had a lot of incentive from government to develop a very strong industrial system, uh, to go to very high intensive agriculture. And we feel the impact of that uh, nowadays, right? So we moved uh, from from central area uh, Brazil, okay, so Sao Paulo, Rio, uh, Mato Grosso, we went up north, okay, producing a lot. In the south, we had a lot of, uh, of uh, already uh, uh, developed areas because of the influence of Italians and Germans, the, the immigrants, they, they came uh, uh, also Dutch people. So a little bit different scenario, but I think it's a reality now. And we are certainly aligned, uh, and I think we really need to be uh, together in that. And we believe, of course, Brazil has a lot of also relations with uh, uh, US that's not perhaps so uh, so strong or, or give so much attention to the environment. But we certainly feel that it's absolutely necessary that we share the same views uh, with New York. Okay. Yeah, I fully agree with this uh, point. And I think one of the key elements that we can also look at is of course, if you look at uh, the policies that you have in Europe, I think uh, the European Commission, for example, plays an important role in trying to push for this, uh, let's say, sustainability aspect, which is something that uh, is not necessarily uh, related to a specific country need or, or a specific country support, but rather uh, as a community, which is something that in Brazil, I think, is not that strong. Uh, but also in Europe, if you look into the different countries, they have different realities, right? And of course, uh, it's difficult to compare, let's say, developed countries uh, with uh, other countries which are still uh, developing and still promoting innovation internally. So I think Brazil uh, is not yet there and there are still th things that can, a lot of things can be improved in relation to how you can actually have a sustainable agriculture and improve um, productivity by controlling better the, the let's say, the, the production. And, uh, but the, as uh, Marja was mentioning, I think it's, uh, it's towards that direction and we can see also the, the change on the perspective of people and uh, hopefully that will become something closer into this uh, mindset as well in the future. Okay, well, thanks a lot for, 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 this, uh, for, for, for these answers. Um, unfortunately, uh, we're a bit uh, restricted in terms of time. Um, so um, I will now move forward to uh, the last slide of today's uh, presentation. And it's mostly to sort of um, say that, you know, if, if you do want to receive regular updates, uh, information about um, Enriching Brazil, um, and all our upcoming uh, events, uh, services, uh, webinars, uh, please do feel free to, to follow us on social media. 
um, and um, you'll receive all the latest updates uh, regarding the project. I'd like to thank um, all the speakers today. Um, this was a great uh, presentation, um, a great topic. Uh, the discussion in the Q&A was lively. Um, so I would like to thank all the attendees, speakers once again. And um, that's it for today's webinar. Uh, big thank you, and I hope to, to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.